Hey there all, welcome back to the last part of our conversation on vascular and lymphatic conditions. Okay, so we're going to talk about a one that's actually a little bit more common than you might think. So this is Raynaud phenomenon or Raynaud disease. In the past, and you can see I've still got it a little bit here, we had a possessive on these, and for whatever reason, by convention, they're dropping the possessive apostrophe S on these. So I'm trying to be more up to date. You can see it's a little incomplete on my updates here, but trying here. Okay, so it used to be Raynaud's, now we say Raynaud. Eh, it is what it is. Okay, so the phenomenon versus the disease. So this is a condition marked by actually, honestly, a, almost a subtype of a presentation. So phenomenon, let's do that one first. The presentation is brief episodes of vasospasm. You know vasospasm from our cardiac stuff, right? From the Prince metal angina condition. Instead of it happening in the heart, it happens to the arteries of the fingers and toes. And kind of similar to Prince metal angina, episodes of stress and anxiety cause these, these manifestations. But more unique to Raynaud phenomenon is that cold temperature and vibration are triggers. So uh, vibration isn't usually a huge issue. Um, sometimes it can be with some folks in different lines of work, like if they're near types of equipment that emit kind of a high frequency uh, mobility sort of vibration. But most of the time it's cold temperature that's an issue, whether it's winter or, for example, reaching into your freezer or getting cold packs out of the, you know, the, the cold freezer at the, the clinic, that sort of thing. So it's often secondary to a variety of causes, and it usually is more severe when it's secondary. For whatever reason, Raynaud phenomenon is more likely to affect older men. I do want you to know the epidemiology on that one, okay? Because that one does help a little bit with your expectations on which patients might have this concern. Okay, in contrast is the disease. It's the same presentation as phenomenon. However, you have to have had a history of the condition for two years with no clear reason that it's happening and no symptom progression. The vast majority of these cases are young women. I do want you to know that. So that's women ages 20 to 50. Thankfully, it's rare to see tissue necrosis with this condition, so that's a good thing. So whether it's disease or phenomenon, they don't fully know why it happens in the disease process. So in other words, you have a lot of young women with this issue with their fingers getting blue and whatnot, and they don't know why. However, in secondary Raynaud phenomenon, there are a variety of reasons, and the classic ones are usually an autoimmune condition. Now, sometimes it can be medication-related, sometimes there's an infectious etiology, sometimes there's an atherosclerotic or other obstructive vascular disease etiology, so that's often what we see more often. That actually follows with our understanding of cardiovascular diseases in which there's a concurrent uh, risk factor for them only in the older population. But again, in other words, the epidemiology on phenomenon, especially when it's secondary, remains a tendency for older males. Okay. Okay. So for whatever reason, the disease is more common than the phenomenon. And despite the name, disease has a less severe presentation than phenomenon. And again, remember, most of the time in phenomenon, it's going to be secondary. Okay. So disease is young women we don't know why it happens, but it's a less severe presentation. Secondary phenomenon, despite the name, is a more severe presentation. It's older males, okay? So it's, I'm not sure why that, that happens, but, but it does. Okay, so again, this is demonstrating to you what's happening. So let's say this right here, this circle right here, is the lumen, the space that the blood has to flow through. In an acute irritation of the condition, it narrows significantly. So this construction of blood flow is quite significant and explains why these individuals lose their, their sense of touch. Um, their skin may experience significant pallor. You can get blue or white on your fingertips, depending. And remember that you can use the nail bed to help detect cyanosis in individuals with um, stronger skin tone. So this gives you a sense of the etiology. Okay, so during an attack, again, little to no blood flow hits the affected body parts. Um, and then later it may turn red and throb, tingle, burn, or feel numb as the blood flow returns. So think of it as a similar thing to like, oh, my foot fell asleep because I was sitting strangely, except much, much, much more. So cold temperature and stress on both of them makes it manifest. And seriously, one of the classics is pulling an item out of the freezer. So you're like, oh, I guess I'll have a frozen pizza. Reach in and pull it out. Wham, your fingers come out blue. Those few seconds of exposure are all it takes. So in general, it's anything under 60 Fahrenheit that will cause it. In its most severe presentation, it can create sores that can actually damage the skin. And that can get bad enough that you have gangrene on the fingers, although honestly, this is rare. Personally, I have not seen it hit a gangrene territory, although I have seen sores on the finger pads. 
usually in a new onset of the, the condition, like someone didn't know they had it. So what do we do? A lot of it's education and prevention, really. So avoid the cold exposure. So that might be as simple as wearing gloves or an oven mitt when you pull something out of something from the freezer. If they are engaging in a smoking behavior, they need to stop because that's causing vasoconstriction and making the problem worse. If they have uh, finger guards, uh, if they have fingers with, like if they're the kind of like more fragile condition, a more severe condition, they may need to have finger guards on, on their, in their typical use. Otherwise, they need to avoid, this is where I say sometimes at your line of work this happens, a power drill, for example. The vibration of a power drill can cause it. So a tool that has a vibratory component to its use. Otherwise, um, they may need to take a blood pressure medication to help vasodilate their blood vessels, particularly in the winter. And there is some evidence that's not terrible that omega-3 fatty acids help a little bit in prevention of, these, of the uh, aggravation of the condition. So this is a good one for patient education, honestly. Okay, let's kick over to a more serious one, in all honesty, acute compartment syndrome. Some of you may have seen this in the athletic population. The odds are good that you were seeing kind of a, a more, um, a less intense version of this, but it's entirely possible that those folks who were getting this, it's it can become a lot worse. So occasionally I do have a student who describes, oh yeah, Dr. G, when I, you know, my coach told me that I have acute compartment syndrome. So let's talk about what that can look like. So this is increased pressure within a closed fascial compartment. This is an anatomic source. And because of the increased pressure in a closed system, you get impaired local circulation. It is considered a surgical emergency because without relieving the pressure, you are going to get ischemia and tissue necrosis such that you probably end up with a limb amputation. It happens fast. This is hot and it's fast. So. The vast majority of your cases are associated with a fracture. Yes, fracture. This is one of the more common things that tends to cause it. And it's almost always fractures to the lower extremity. So a lot of times what happens is you get a tibial fracture or a distal radius fracture. So the most common is tibial, next is distal radius. So honestly, these are sports injuries or fall injuries, okay? But there can be other ones. You can have a crush injury. You can have drug overdose. I've actually seen a couple of these that are really bad. Reperfusion injuries, burns. There are a lot of different things that can cause it. And this one is the one you may have been familiar with if you weren't already working in a hospital setting. And sometimes I see it specifically in my track athletes because they're using that, that bit of their leg a little bit more. But there's a lot of different etiologies. Basically, you just need a situation in which there's increased pressure in a closed fascial compartment, and the two regions that tend to cause that are the forearm and the calf. So a lot of times, um, it's a tibial shaft fracture, though, if I'm being totally honest. I do want you to know that it is more common in males under the age of 35. In fact, almost all of the cases I have seen are in that, that demographic group. So I'm trying to think. I've had a couple of young women, mid-20s, and they were all track athletes. But yeah, this is pretty common. It's a behavioral thing. Who is, who is engaging in behaviors that have a high risk component and can cause fractures? There you go, right? Um, it can sometimes happen in folks with the hemophilia disorder, but by and large, it's, it's younger folks engaging in sports activities and things like that. So again, this is a situation in which you have um, a small space, high volume, and you end up with ischemia that can cause irreversible necrosis, okay? It's, it's surprisingly strong in its presentation. So let's look at it because you absolutely need to be able to recognize it, okay? So it's a severe pain that's out of proportion to the injury. It's not to say that tibial fractures don't hurt. It's just that it's, it seems quite significant, higher than you might expect. Early on, the tissue near the injury, like where the compartment syndrome is starting to build, becomes tense. And if you were to touch it, it almost feels like a tree. So with, with the tree bark, an almost wooden-like feeling of the region. The pain is deep often burning, which makes sense, ischemia burns, and they start to lose their sense of touch. This indicates that you're starting to have some of the nerve, nerve damage, honestly. And then there are the classic five Ps that are an absolute red flag, okay? So the context in which you are most likely to see these is a young individual who's engaged in something like a sporting activity or some sort of uh, polytrauma, and they have maybe a broken limb, you don't know, but you feel the leg and this is what you feel. You can't find the pulse. They can't feel when you're touching the leg. They have, let me say, try to say it right, poikylothermia. This means that they can't maintain a proper temperature for whatever is correct. So let's say it's winter, the leg can't get warm. Let's say it's summer, it doesn't seem to cool. I feel like most of the time that's actually what you're going to see is that it's summer and the leg can't seem to cool. It just feels really hot. 
um, it can't move. Paralysis, that's the nerve damage happening. And depending on the skin tone, it will demonstrate pallor, okay? So again, anterior compartment of the leg, in other words, the shin, is the most common sight. I would say, just this is just Liz stats, I would say 90% of the cases I've seen, yeah, are to the anterior compartment of the leg. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, oh, I probably should have given you a warning. Sorry, these are kind of rough images. This is what it looks like when they do a fasciotomy. So seriously, if you get someone in who has all those five Ps and it's happening right now, like they can no longer move their leg, the surgeon is seriously going to knock you out, throw down some iodine, and take a scalpel and whoosh, go for it. Because if they don't, the trade-off is you might lose the leg. Seriously, and this isn't a young individual. We want to save limbs and individuals of all ages, but particularly when there's a high likelihood we can recover the limb, right? Recover function and stuff like that. So these are massive injuries caused by the surgical management. So that's them opening up the anterior compartment of the leg. Very, very classic here. The majority of individuals that I've treated for this condition, this is the location. Occasionally you get it in that anterior, in the, um, in the compartment with the, with the radius and the ulna. And this is more of what it'll look like here. Although I've only seen this a couple times. Okay, so when it heals, yeah, it's massive. It's a huge scar. Sometimes I see individuals in the community or at the gym, and I see those scars. I know exactly what that is. So this particular individual, had to take. they took a skin graft from the thigh and put it here. So that's what you're seeing there to kind of improve the, honestly, the cosmesis or the way that it looks. Here's one for that interior. You can see right here. I'm guessing they did a little bit of grafting right here, but I'm not 100% sure on this image. So you have, within onset, you have about six hours to save the limb. It is so fast. During this time, you really need to keep the limb at the level of the heart to prevent any amount of hypoperfusion. We really need blood into that area of the body to try and you know, reverse any cellular damage that's occurred. We're trying to prevent cellular death. They also will sometimes put them on supplemental O2, just really, really trying to make sure we have good saturation, O2 saturation of the limb. Prognosis. Okay, so if necrosis occurs before the fasci, then there's a high likelihood of infection, and it may then require amputation. Um, if you don't require amputation and there is infection, you're going to probably enter wound care, and they're going to engage in debridement to try and prevent the bug from getting other places, because it really can. It can seed, and it can do a systemic spread. The prognosis really does depend on how quickly you can catch it. If you get it in fast enough, and they do the fasciotomy and the ED within six hours, you're going to do great. There's an almost 100% recovery of the limb. So like this person right here, that looks like a full recovery, like just based on how healthy that limb looks. Notice how this calf has like a very typical look. It's not too skinny. When you see those ones that are too skinny afterward, some loss of tissue mass occurred. In other words, they lost some muscle. After those six hours, though, you may at least end up with some nerve damage. But in general, if you get outwards of 12 hours, only two-thirds of folks recover normal limb function. So you have a very, very small time frame to make the decision to send the person to the emergency department. Okay, so after the fascia is performed and the swelling goes down, a lot of times they'll skin graft it. Long term, you are a re this is a real foe, contractures. That's one of the really big issues, and that's when I've worked with these patients. They have uh, the mild neurologic deficit. It's almost always foot drop because you've lost the health of the nerve that allows you to dorsiflex, right? And so a lot of times what I'm helping with is contracture and foot drop management via orthoses. In addition, many patients are upset with the obviousness of the scarring in that there's a big dent. It also usually has a little bit of neuropathic pain, sometimes a lot of neuropathic pain because there is nerve damage. And in some individuals who do return to sport, there's so much scarring in there that it means a high likelihood of it coming back, which is really scary. I, to me, it would not be wild if the uh, presentation or if a manifestation of acute compartment syndrome with fasciotomy took you out of your sport. That's how serious it can be. Uh, infection in this situation can lead to a lot of serious complications. And again, you may need to help the patient with range of motion recovery. All right, team, I think that completes it for our vascular and lymphatic conditions. Thanks.